Then there is Dr. Natalie Henderson, who did medical school at Ross and then came here for her residency in pediatrics and then her ICU fellowship, um, and then has been on our faculty in ICU since July. And um, so we'll let them go ahead and get started to talk about our transport team. Okay. Thanks for letting me come talk. Uh, I will wait on our slides, but um, I have the privilege of getting to work with a great group of people, some of whom came today. Uh, are just for kids transport team. Gotcha. All right, here? Yep. All right. And um, I'm going to start and kind of tell you more about the structure and uh, how our team works, and then Dr. Henderson's going to follow me with some case scenarios that could occur. Uh, on this team. So I was thinking about. Uh, the last time I updated this venue uh, with the transport team, and it was a really long time ago. So I was uh, seven months pregnant when I stood here with the, uh, my daughter on the left, and she is now 14. So uh, it's probably about time to do it again. And the other one didn't, obviously it was just a dream. I wanted to go back um, to talk about our history to kind of show you where we've been, and we have 39 years of history with the Just for Kids transport team. So in 1978, it was the neonatal ground transport team. Dr. Roger Schott and Dr. Larry Cook, among others, uh, helped uh, get this team off the ground. It was the first neonatal uh, transport team in the state of Kentucky. And it was um, created by a, a grant <coughs> from the Crusade for Children, as well as uh, others who uh, invested their life's blood in getting it started. The first year, they did 64 transports, and we have gone nowhere but up since then. So after they realized how long uh, ground transport can take, we decided we needed a plane to get farther to pick up preterm and, and term babies, and so we rapidly moved towards having a fixed-wing transport system as well. Uh, the picture that you have, whoops, wrong button, go back. This picture, um, most of these people are, are no longer in the on the team, uh, no longer around, uh, but we're obviously integral in, in getting our babies here to children's. Uh, this is a picture from the mid-80s, but if you look closely right in the middle, uh, that's Kyle Combs, who is still a nurse practitioner here in the um, Division of Pediatric Cardiology. And then this guy right here is David, who's still an RT on our fifth floor. So all of them uh, part of our history. In 1985, we added maternal transports. And um, instead of taking high-risk babies uh, who could have difficulties during transport, um, in conjunction with the Department of Obstetrics, we began treating or transporting high-risk moms here before delivery. And the Just for Kids team, um, at that time, the baby buggy, uh, was part of this transport. We did this for about 14 years or so, the last ones being in about the 1999 range. There was an attempt at adding pediatric transports in 1988, and it went fairly well, um, but only about 8% of the transports for that year were pediatrics. And as you'll see in a minute, it's kind of leveled off a little bit more um, over the years. However, the need uh, for neonatal transport was uh, being recognized and increasing. And in 1992, the team surpassed 500 uh, trips. By 1995, it was too big to just take a unit-based team. So a unit-based team is one where the RNs and RTs come out of staffing, where they actually are taking care of babies and then just leave to go do transport. But uh, the need was too big, and so by 1995, we finally had a dedicated transport team where their sole job was transport. So this is a picture of the first um, dedicated transport team. And you will also see Kyle here again uh, as one of those, that member. 
Brenda Bolin, who some of you may recognize still, just retired last year from the transport team after many, many years of service. Leslie Carter, also many years of service. She's now a nurse practitioner at South Louisville Pediatrics. And then Donna Callahan, still, the sign sheet? still teaching no, me about no, transport no. after. She was bringing it. I think she's not there. She yeah. there. By 2000, we had um, a brief name change where we added the name of our uh, Air Ambulance Corporation, which was a locally owned um, aircraft, both fixed wing and rotor. So we became stat carriages for kids, um, which you can see up there, how we sort of evolved over the years. Um, and then eventually that local Air Ambulance Service was sold and we became just for kids. Yeah, so yeah. Once again. Uh, and this is a picture you can recognize the same thing. Uh, uh, but it's still our same plane today. So now we enter um, the last decade. And so in the last decade, we have uh, markedly increased the number of transports. And one of the ways we did this is we started doing the transports, both critical and non-critical, <coughs> among the campuses of Norton Healthcare. And so in 2010, we started transporting from the medical center. And then in 2014, we transport from the ED and the floor at Norton Women's and Children's. And all that has led to now a very large transport service with over 2,000 trips annually. In 2017, we now have a new name, a new balloon, and a new patch on our shoulders, but hopefully still the same dedication to pediatric transport. So it takes a lot of people to make a neonatal and pediatric transport team run correctly and run well. Um, our transport manager is Penny Moss Granholm. Uh, she is a nurse by training and is currently um, getting her doctorate in nursing practice. We have Mary Lynn Shackelford, who's our director of patient care services, critical care, where transport is under that umbrella. And uh, Mary Lynn has told me about when she was a unit based transport nurse and doing transports with Dr. Cook back in the day when every transport had a physician on it. And that has changed quite a bit over the decade. I'm the medical director. And then we have several different physician leaders that work with our team. We have Dr. Cross from the ED that helps us uh, with that group. And then we have Dr. Gravari, who's new to our team, and Dr. Maida, who um, are integrally involved with our neonatology arm. Our team members are the heart of our team. We have nine RNs, nine RTs, nine EMTs. This is uh, Darcy here, one of our RNs. This is Kevin, one of our EMTs, Malia and Spider-Man all together here. Um, and without them, of course, we couldn't do what we do uh, every day. The medical control physicians, there are just too many of them to try and put pictures up. That's all the PICU division, all the NICU division, all the ED division. And then occasionally we even have the pediatric surgeons help us with activation and transport. Um, for patients that fall under their expertise. We also have um, Air Methods, who is currently our air ambulance provider corporation. And so every trip of those 2,000 or more um, will be filtered through a dispatching center where a communications specialist helps us get the team where they need to go. This dispatching center is actually in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, not local anymore. And then, of course, we have our pilots that help get us safely where we need to go. So like any large transport team, we have three different modes of transport. These uh, ambulances, this is our new one. You can see the Norton Children's and the new balloon. This is our newest um, paint scheme. And uh, we own four ambulances. Norton owns those. And then, hopefully, they are out the door in less than 15 minutes, which is um, much less than the national average. Our aircraft, this is our plane, same plane, just now uh, prettily painted <coughs> with the balloon. Uh, it is um, a King Air 200 for anybody who's uh, interested in aircraft. And we um, try and get that off the ground within 45 minutes of activation of the trip. And then this is our rotor wing uh, painted as Air Methods Kentucky. And we also hope that it lifts off from the helipad within 45 minutes. 
But here's um, the last 15 years of our trip volume, and you can see kind of how it escalated. The blue here are the neonatal trips, and then the red are our pediatric trips. And so the neonatal trips have been fairly steady year to year, between 550 and 700 trips in any given year. And then the pediatrics, you can see, was smaller up until the point where we started doing the multi-campus uh, trips where it escalated markedly. If you take out those from the medical center and from Norton Women's and Children's, the pediatric trips to other referral centers are about 550 a year. So this is a map of our area, and these um, points help show you where our um, referral centers are. So each of these is our um, major referral center, uh, defined as a center where we go 15 trips or more per year. So the blue are the ones that are predominantly neonatal and the orange are more pediatric than neonatal, and then the red are both. And so this is Harrison County, um, Floyd, Clark, and Oldham County, as far as where our um, babies come from, and then this is Flaget down in Bardstown. From a pediatric side, we go to Madison, Indiana, King's Daughters a lot, and then to Marion Springview in Lebanon. And then for both neonatal and pediatrics, we spend a lot of time <coughs> Uh, in the air going to Paducah and Owensboro, Glasgow, this is Twin Lakes Litchfield, I believe, um, Elizabethtown, which for us is usually a drive, and then Campbellsville. Realized that our greatest referral center is Jefferson County, so I didn't include that one. We get many, many, many trips from all of the hospitals uh, within our own county. So uh, these are um, this is a breakdown of the neonatal trips by diagnosis from, from one year. And as you can imagine, the chief complaint dealing with respiratory distress or failure is the most common. Uh, this is a number of about 650 patients. Uh, also, perinatal asphyxia, neonatal seizures, congenital heart disease or dysrhythmia, problems with the bowel. Um, other is a huge bucket, of course, dealing with things anywhere from just a straightforward consultation, failure to thrive genetic abnormalities, um, pre prematurity just <coughs> after the diagnosis, um, and then take backs are those where we try and bring the baby closer to their home uh, at a different facility if they're not ready to actually leave the hospital. The thing that I found um, most interesting about this, and the neonatologist can probably educate me more over the years, but over 10% of our trips are related now to neonatal abstinence syndrome. On the pediatric side, obviously the chief complaint dealing with respiratory distress or failure is also the most common. This um, group of patients is about 1,400 patients. And the team can uh, also uh, agree with me. This is a huge wedge as well. We see a lot of kids with either first time or recurrent um, status epilepticus as part of that or altered mental status for other reasons. Um, we start to see more of the trauma and surgical patients here. We are um, the transport service for trauma for the medical center. Uh, so we do a, a fair amount of acute trauma from there. Um, others more distant tend to be better to do a one-way trip just to shorten the time to getting to this level one trauma center. Um, environmental um, causes are allergic reactions, a lot of ingestions. We also see that fairly frequently. In the other bucket is DKA, which the team, I'm sure, would say they see enough of um, DKA as well. So our Just for Kids um, team is pretty good at the procedures that they do. This is a smattering of them. The RN and the RT are both cross-trained to do all the procedures that they can within their board scope of practice. So here on this column is basically our airway column. It's highlighting they can all intubate uh, kids, and then this kind of goes down some of our difficult airway. Uh, the team who is here is going to be really mad at me by saying, because I've said we've never had to do a needle crike in the field before. So I, I am completely not superstitious, so I hope that that will not bite them back again. But we do train for it. 
And also a highlight of this team is that we can do heated high flow on all three modes of transport. And that is not necessarily true when you look around at other transport systems. So we can run, just for anybody who does deal with um, kids coming to the ward or to the ICU, we can run up to 25 liters per minute, depending on the size of the patient. And um, that's been helpful for us for preventing the need for intubation. Our team does do central vascular access in the babies. They usually do umbilical lines for that, of course. And then in the bigger kids, they use interosseous lines. Um, they can place chest tubes uh, in all age groups. And then they carry a um, medium-sized pharmacy. And they can pretty much do uh, treat any acute um, critical illness that they can come across. When they're not doing clinical medicine, they do a fair amount of outreach. And uh, for instance, every year in May, there's a NICU reunion that brings together the former NICU patients as well as um, their caregivers and families, and the transport team takes part in that. Um, if you want something to do in June, I believe it's the first weekend in June every year, it's our annual fundraiser, Wings for Kids, and it's, it's pretty fun. It is a remote control air show and auction uh, that the team comes out, gives ambulance tours, uh, the rotor wing comes and sits down for tours, and our fixed wing flies incredibly low for a, an aircraft. Uh, you can easily read the Just for Kids on the bottom of the plane when it flies by. Um, we also do community meet and greets, go out to school health fairs, and I'm sure many of you, like on this side of the room, have participated in the SPARK program, but basically we take the SPARK program out of these four walls and take the portable high fidelity mannequin out to community partners and to EMS groups and run pediatric simulations with them in conjunction with the transport team. We um, have a fair amount of quality metrics that we have to follow. Of course, there are some that are required um, by a group by the hospital, and we've been doing that for many, uh, many years, such as neonatal temperature, medication errors. In injuries, devices, and that kind of thing. In 2013, the six major transport teams in Ohio came together in a summit and created what they felt to be the top 12 quality metrics for transport. And so we've taken on following these and seeing what we need to do to improve our service um, with at least the starting point of these 12. Um, they include a lot of the things that we already mentioned that the hospital would follow in addition to um, things surrounding intubation, uh, mobilization times, and that kind of thing. So here's an example of one of the graphs that we follow. So this is 2016 with um, the percentage of neonates that are found hypothermic at admission. And of course with the Reaching for Zero <coughs> initiative, we want ours to be a flat line down here. And honestly, um, Per month, it looks like some are higher than others, uh, obviously. Um, but if we fail to document uh, temperature at the end of our trip, then we have to count them as hypothermic because we can't prove that they weren't. And so some of this is where we've um, uncovered that we need to work on our documentation as much as on keeping the babies warm during the trips. A lot of people want to know how much transport costs. And unfortunately, that cost has increased exponentially over the past 20 years. Uh, the reason that is, is more competition. Um, everything's more expensive uh, surrounding uh, an air ambulance service and ground. And so there's a big dilution of what's happening right now uh, in air ambulance services. There used to be few ambulance, a uh, few rotors more trips, and now there's tons of rotors and the same number of trips. But there's still the same amount of overhead that you have to have to safely move a helicopter around with patients and, and the crew. And so, for instance, um, when we had StatCare here, which serviced um, Louisville Medical Center, the helicopter particularly related to U of L Hospital and for us and our helicopter, they would do 90 <clears throat> to 100 trips per month, and that included ours. And now the same helicopter kind of servicing this area does 20 to 25 per month. 
but still has to have the same amount of excellence and coverage. So um, our average initial bill for a ground ambulance is around $800 to $4,000, and that is related to the distance traveled and any procedures that may have been done for the patient on it, any temporary um, equipment, and then our overhead for costs. And you can see there's a lot different numbers <coughs> when you start talking about the initial bill for an air ambulance. So that's either rotor wing or fixed wing. Um, taking it 100 miles or taking it 2,000 miles is about $50,000. And so we try and <coughs> do what's right for the patient, both from an acuity standpoint and um, a financial standpoint. Reasons why this is, I already mentioned them, a lot of the competition. Um, Jet fuel, fairly expensive. There's again kind of an overhead that's defined as a cost of readiness number where the Air Ambulance Corporation has a whole group of, of ships, airships in their service. And they take however much the overhead is for all of those and divide them out by the number they have and that's the starting cost no matter what your patient has or what they may need during the trip or how far the trip is. And so all of that is, is fairly expensive. Now I said this is the initial bill. That doesn't mean that's what the, the corporation receives, obviously, for that. Um, reimbursement's fairly poor among the Medicaid and Medicare services and other managed care. But interestingly, the bottom hasn't fallen out of the Kentucky market. And so the reimbursement for Kentucky is still better than some of the other states. And it actually even changes if you go in eastern Kentucky versus western Kentucky, and I don't have the knowledge to know why that is. But um, it is interesting, and I'll show you a graph in a second. There are customer relations teams with both Norton and Air Methods that help the families with billing, filing their insurance, their billing, the residual bills. And so despite the fact that the family gets that number sent to their home as a first um, shock, that's not what they eventually are responsible for. So this is a, a map of the air ambulance services that are in or near Kentucky uh, today. So the blue are Air Methods Corporation, so the one that we um, contract with. Here's our little plane, and um, our King Air sits at Clark Regional Airport uh, over in Sellersburg, and we drive over um, to get there to it. Uh, and then this is our primary rotor wing, it is um, sitting at the Harrison County Hospital over in Corden, Indiana. I wish it were sitting right on top of us, but we only have one helipad. Um, we can occasionally use this uh, rotor wing that sits at Hard Memorial <coughs> down in um, E-Town. And both of these have the capability <coughs> to carry neonatal isolates, which is one of the limiting factors for just being able to pick up any um, aircraft and bring it to us for use. The pediatric arm can occasionally use this um, airship that sits in Frankfurt as well. So we have competing entities that are trying to get that market share in Kentucky. Um, PHI has four, there's two airships that sit facing each other in London, just of interest of different um, corporations. And so we have those. And then this is Aerovac Life Team from uh, Missouri, who has just inundated the Kentucky market. Very competitive service. None of those have pediatric transport teams, just so you know, no specialty teams. So kind of back to where um, uh, reimbursement is lucrative and where population exists. So this is a map from September of last year that shows where all the rotor wing bases are in our country. And all the little blue circles are one rotor base plus a 10 minute fly zone out from it. And so you can see Kentucky's pretty much blue. So if you want to have a life or limb threatening accident, then Kentucky is a pretty safe place to do it. Do not do it in Montana or South Dakota or Alaska because your goose is good. You're pretty much done. So uh, plenty of air services to come uh, east of the Mississippi and help us out. So here are our colleagues and our competitors. So these are the, the pediatric transport teams that surround us. We have two groups in the two children's hospitals in St. Louis. 
And then there are two different combined pediatric neonatal transport teams in Indiana. In Indianapolis, this is Raleigh, and this is St. Vincent's. And then, of course, Cincinnati Children's here. The Kentucky Kids Crew is the University of Kentucky uh, group. And then Nashville has two, both Vanderbilt, and then one program that's at a private hospital that's neonatal only. You can see kind of where our catchment area is. I mean, if you take little circles around each of that, I think this is Louisville right here, and so we're kind of shaped like this, and that kind of goes back to the referral centers that we looked at earlier. A, a survey was sent out uh, last year and um, was sent out to every pediatric transport team and using that as an umbrella for neonatal and pediatric transport teams. And so we are able to compare ourselves to the respondents of that survey. So for the most part of the respondents, 75% said that they had a combined neonatal and pediatric transport team, and, and that is us as well. Uh, about 30%, but still the majority said that they use a an RN and RT combination of teams, which is what we use. There are others that use um, advanced practice providers like nurse practitioners, PAs, paramedics are very common, and then EMT basics like um, the other member of our group. Uh, unlike when Dr. Cook and Dr. Schott uh, and all the rest of the neonatologists were forming this group, and there were 100% of physicians on, 100% on, of trips had physicians on it. Now it's very rare to actually have a physician uh, on, a, on a trip, less than 5%. And that's true for us here. That's true for uh, the teams around the country. Uh, in this survey, um, 68, 70% of the team said that residents have absolutely no involvement in transport. And the ACGME actually requires some degree of education about transport. And it's important because uh, residents will go out and become fellows, maybe hopefully interested in critical care medicine, whether it's neonatal or older kids, ED. Um, they might staff an ED and be the first primary um, person seeing the child. And so uh, three years ago, we got involved in the procedure resident uh, rotation. And so they all get a lecture and have the opportunity to go as a ride-along on um, with the team. And so it hasn't, not every resident has gotten to go, um, but a fair amount have. Uh, we are one of the larger tip, uh, teams in the country, doing over 2,000 trips uh, per year. St. Louis um, does about that number. Arkansas Children's does about that number. Um, Cincinnati does about 2,800 a year, CHOP about over 3,000, Dallas over 4,000. So there are some that are bigger than us, but the average team does less than 500 trips per year. Uh, like most teams, we have the ability to do nitric, and like most teams, we do not have the ability to do mobile ECMO, although there are some here that would like us to take, on, take that on. Almost all teams do quality assurance, just like we do. So this is a comparison between just for kids as a specialty team and then um, an EMS service uh, like a street EMT um, group that would come to your door to your um, scene of an accident. So what is the different methodology? A lot of the adult diseases are time sensitive, not to say that pediatrics aren't is not, but the majority, <coughs> Majority of EMS runs are adults, 90% are adults versus 10% of kids. And of those time-sensitive diagnoses, you have things like trauma with a need for source control or other type of surgical intervention. You have STEMIs, you have strokes that need to get to specific types of centers. And so they tend to practice more of the swoop and scoop because they can't do the definitive care at the scene. Um, with the Just for Kids specialty service, we can enact more goal-directed therapy, uh, both at our first look and throughout the trip back. And so that has, as, as Dr. Henderson will show you, has um, helped to <coughs> improve mortality and outcomes. And so our mentality, our, our um, focus is more of a stay and play. So our hospital times are gonna be longer. 
Um, they're going to be doing more interventions on critically ill patients during the trip and hopefully bring the kids back already having done um, some amount of time just like they were in an ICU, wherever they were. They um, are quite good at it. So the Just for Kids team is an inter-facility team. They do not go to scenes. They do not go to people's houses or to offices. And um, there are some combined teams around the country that do do scenes, um, but we um, are not going to do that anytime soon. Uh, we have required medical direction, so at least one call has to be made to a, a physician during the trip uh, to, for read back and verify orders or discussion of evaluation and management, whereas um, an EMS service has more remote medical direction and they do not routinely talk to a physician uh, about their runs. 100% of our intubations are orotracheal with an endotracheal tube, whereas the EMS can do those as well as having expertise um, in blind nasal intubations and in more supraglottic airways. And part of the reason is that some of those just don't fit in um, pediatric patients. We do less trauma, they do more trauma. Uh, we work off of guidelines. So the neonatology group creates and um, I create the pediatric side. So we make these series of guidelines. They're not protocols, so it's actually a different legal word but um, they are guidelines that they can use in case communication were to be completely severed um, for some reason during the trip um, to know what to do with the different types of disease processes, uh, reason for education uh, for the team. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the um, Kentucky Board of EMS, which is the governing body um, for both us and for um, Kentucky EMS, um, approves a list of protocols, and so um, they run off of these protocols. Obviously, we have more certifications uh, for pediatrics than a standard EMS service does. Um, PALS or a pre-hospital pediatric um, uh, uh, certification is an option for the paramedics, but not required. So um, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Henderson. And she's going to give you uh, several examples about why using the Just for Kids team is the way you want to go in your practice. Are you serious? Yes. Yeah. 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 Good morning, everybody. I'm Natalie Henderson. For those who don't know me, I think most of you do from my time here. So we wanted to use the case scenarios. Use the case scenarios to highlight the benefits of using our transport service, both in the neonatal and the pediatric population, as well as a different case where the team may not be the first line of what you would use for that patient. So our first case we're going to highlight, as Karen said, um, our team sees lots of this kind of patient, and so you will come out very clearly what this is. We have a 10-year-old female who presents to your outside hospital. The chief complaint is vomiting and not acting herself. She has a four-hour history of being sleepier than normal, two to three days of vomiting, and two weeks of possible weight loss. She is a healthy girl with no past medical history and just a family history of type 2 diabetes. On physical exam, the physician finds her to be sleepy, but she will rouse to pain, and she's groaning. She's tachycardic, but otherwise hemodynamically stable. She has a respiratory rate of about 20 breaths per minute, and he thinks that she does have two small respirations. She has mild abdominal tenderness and dry mucous membranes. He decides to proceed with a 20 ml per kilo bolus prior to calling the tertiary care center and obtains an initial set of laboratory studies. You see her blood gas there, a pH of 6.9, a PCO2 of 17, a PAO2 of 120, which may be over-exaggerated if it's truly a CBG, um, a bicarbonate of 5, and a base deficit of negative 20. Her point of care glucose is too high to read. And you see her initial renal panel with a sodium of 128, potassium of 6, chloride is 100, bicarbonate of less than 5, and a glucose now reads of 920. So I know that we all know what this diagnosis most likely is. Um, it's DKA, or diabetic ketoacidosis. So unsure of what to do, the outside doctor um, gives 15 units of insulin, a second fluid bolus, and two milliequivalents per kilo of sodium bicarbonate. And then he decides to call for an ICU bed at the tertiary care center. 
this is not an uncommon thing that happens in our world, both for the emergency room and for the pediatric ICU. So he calls through dispatch, and when he what happens is he will call a 1-800 number and be connected with our dispatch unit. The dispatch unit will then call into the pediatric ICU and reach the attending's phone. And so either the PICU fellow who is on or the PICU attending will be placed on a monitored call with this outside hospital. He discusses with the PICU fellow and explains the exam. The glucose now is 500. As you recall, previously the glucose was 920. That is down approximately 400 in a two-hour period. And our typical goal for dropping glucose is 50 to 100 in a one-hour period. So this is about four times or more what we would prefer to do. The team goes ahead and establishes a second IV, repeats the blood gas, and then calls back to discuss with a PICU fellow. The decision's made to start D10 with normal saline at a maintenance rate, start an insulin drip at 0.05 units per kilo per hour. And the reason for doing this is the typical dose is to do 0.1 per kilo per hour. However, the patient's blood glucose has already dropped so rapidly that they decide to go with a lower rate. The point of care glucose remains stable over the next 30 minutes when the team is able to recheck this. So the point of this case is to demonstrate what our team can do in the pediatric population. For any students or residents or fellows out there, there is very much a paucity of data as it regards to pediatric and neonatal transport medicine. When you do a PubMed search, you get lots of return on transport at the molecular level. You don't get a lot on the transport team level. So if anyone's interested in this as a research project, trust me, there's plenty of room for it. Most importantly, I wanted to point out that in a New England Journal of Medicine study on diabetic ketoacidosis, that bicarbonate therapy increases the risk for cerebral edema in DKA patients. I just put in that plug for any of you students who go into emergency medicine and may be working at these rural hospitals, that especially in the pediatric population, that this is a very important point. As it regards to our case and then our talk for today, Using a specialized team versus a non-specialized team has been shown to decrease intensive care-related events. And what they mean by intensive care-related events, loss of airway protection, loss of intravenous access, or ongoing hypotension. So if you look at, there were only 2% of specialized teams compared to 20% of non-specialized teams that had intensive care-related adverse events. And then another more, because that, that study I just mentioned was in 1994. So there was a follow-up study done in 2009, published in pediatrics, that looked at this very thing again. The transport, they looked at specialized pediatric and neonatal transport teams, and they looked at the safety of having a pediatric trained team and a non-pediatric trained team. And so these same unplanned events were looked at in over 55 patients. And in looking at this, specialized teams only had 1.5% adverse events compared to 61% in the non-specialized teams. And maybe more striking is that death was more common in those who were transported by non-specialized teams, 23% compared to 9% of the patients studied. So I also wanted to look at our neonatal patients. And in doing this, I, it's been a little bit since I rotated through the NICU. I think it was December 2011. And so I spoke with Leah Gravari and looked at a typical case that they might see in the neonatal unit. And I wanted to do this to highlight some of the things that our team can offer without even having a physician present and how they can be in ICU without being in a children's hospital. So we have, that's a 3.85 kilo baby, or in the NICU world, 3,850 gram male, um, born by spontaneous vaginal delivery to a healthy 31-year-old female. He is full term at 39 weeks. Um, there was noted to be meconium at delivery, but she was otherwise healthy with normal ultrasounds and labs throughout her pregnancy. The tertiary care calls for the baby buggy, which is what it was known for for a long time. The chief complaint to the doctor was that the baby is having retractions and requiring oxygen to maintain normal saturations. The initial blood gas was a pH of 725 and a PCO2 of 55, and a chest x-ray is pending. So our transport team is dispatched, and on arrival, they find a baby who had meconium at delivery, had received positive pressure ventilation for about three minutes, but did not require chest compressions. Initial glucose was found to be 32, and the blood gas on their arrival was 72 with a PCO2 of 70, and the baby is on two liters and 100% FiO2. The chest x-ray demonstrates a right-sided pneumothorax, 
and the blood pressure at the time is 70 over 45, but the baby is poorly perfused on their exam. The team realizes that the baby is not doing well, and so they proceed. They go ahead and start a second <coughs> peripheral IV. They give the baby 10 ml per kilo of normal saline. The decision is made to intubate the baby, and they choose the ventilator settings as shown. They repeat the blood gas, which is not dissimilar from previous, 723 PCO2 of 60, and they needle and place a chest tube um, where the pneumothorax is present in the right chest. Prior to transport home, they call their med control, which would either be a, a neonatologist or a NICU fellow. The physician there says they discuss sedation, so we ha do have sedation guidelines that the teams can use to transport children back who have advanced airways. Also, they discuss the indications for the use of surfactant, and the team asks if the patient remains stable to go ahead and place umbilical lines so that that will already be taken care of and will give the um, team access if they were to need that. The team returns to the tertiary care children's hospital about 90 minutes later. That's definitely an underestimation, um, if, if I'm honest about how long that will take and if they do all of these procedures. If it's they go to the hospital, they grab the baby, and they come back, that's definitely feasible. Um, but if you're in Paducah, Owensboro, or somewhere else, it would be a longer period of time. So the team has already placed a UAC and a UVC. They have an endotracheal tube and a chest tube. They have already administered surfactant remains on the same ventilator settings, and the next gas is 734-4578 with a base deficit of negative one. And I use this case to illustrate our team has done all of these procedures so that when the team here at, or at excuse me, Norton Children's Hospital receives the child, the child is already stabilized and they can proceed with doing more neonatal care without having to place all of these lines, administer surfactant. And so the patient's care has been improved by the team being able to do all of these things for them. So, like I just said, they were able to place umbilical lines, additional IV access, endotracheally intubate the child, they placed the chest tube, they followed guidelines. The team also does medication initiation. So I don't highlight this in any of the cases, but for instance, a couple weeks ago, our team um, brought back a patient to me on an epinephrine, an epinephrine drip, a norepinephrine drip, dopamine, and vasopressin. Um, they're able to use prostaglandins for our patients that we suspect congenital heart disease. They can mix D10, as we discussed in our previous case. There have even been instances where they will take the double bag therapy, if time allows, from the children's hospital to the diabetic patient. They can do OptiFlow, so if the patient is brought back with a, by our team on OptiFlow to the floor, they will then transition them to vapotherm upon arrival. They can do pediatric ventilators, and then we do have nitric oxide availability. And the last case I wanted to use to highlight when our team might not be the first line that we would use, and also to highlight some transport law that does exist and how that affects us with Medicaid, Medicare, CMS. Because while it's not something that we think about in our everyday lives, it definitely governs how we do this job. So this is a four-week-old infant who presents to the pediatrician's office for a follow-up and a weight check. This is not an uncommon situation, unfortunately. The infant is found to be in respiratory distress with a rate of 60 to 70 breaths per minute. The child has hepatomegaly of 4 to 5 centimeters, has good axillary pulses but weak femoral pulses, and no distal um, dorsalis pedis pulses. The right arm blood pressure is 80 over 65 with a left leg of 45 over 30, and the baby is sweating on exam. The physician is clearly concerned that this could be, anybody have a guess? Okay, coarctation of the aorta. However, the PMD said, oh, I trained at the children's hospital. Let me call for the transport team. So they call for the transport team, and they reach med control. And the med control informs them that the team does not come directly to the pediatrician's office and instructs the pediatrician to send the baby to the emergency department for further evaluation and care. So I wanted to highlight this point. First, it's not illegal for our team to go to the private pediatrician's office. However, if our team was going to every private pediatrician's office in the state of Kentucky for every single child who needed our services, they would never be doing hospital trips. And so the decision's been made to utilize the ERs as the primary source of where our team picks up. Also, then this leaves the PMD with the decision. Is she connected to the hospital? Does she need to call 911 to bring this baby to her hospital? Our team may still be needed for this patient once they are evaluated at the hospital. So MTALA, what is MTALA? So it is Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. What this means is it's the cornerstone of transport law. 
And it was established to prevent inappropriate transfers and more specifically to prohibit people transferring or not accepting patients based upon their financial status. So the receiving hospital can't say, no, I don't want this patient, they have Medicaid. No, I don't want this patient, they're self-pay. So this law prohibits that. So some of the basics. If the patient needs specialized care, it's a mandatory of the outside hospital to transfer the patient. How that applies to us? So the receiving facility has a higher level of care. So if there's a patient that we think, well, that maybe they don't need the Children's Hospital, but Hardin Memorial, Owensboro, Paducah may not be able to offer a trauma team, a PICU, a NICU, a burn unit, a neurosurgeon, et cetera. So there is the mandatory law that they should transfer the patient. And then the receiving facility, us, would need to have the appropriate staff and capacity or beds, which we all know has been a problem in the last several years having that capacity. And when that situation arises, that would be one where you would help the team. Our team may help that outside hospital deliver the patient to another children's hospital that does indeed have the capacity. So some other basics, you can't place contingencies upon transferring the patient. You can't say, well, I'm not going to accept your patient unless you have a surgeon look at them first or I'm not going to accept that patient, they can't pay me. That's a very severe MTALA violation, and it's quite, it's illegal. Um, and this is the one thing I did not realize until diving into this research, but that stability is not mandatory for transports. I think we all assume that you shouldn't transport a patient who is re receiving active CPR. However, being stable um, is more of a subjective term and is not mandatory. So if the benefit of transferring the patient here outweighs the risk, of transporting, then they should be transported. For example, the patient at Hardin who has an, a bowel obstruction who may be unstable and requiring multiple vasoactive drugs <laughs> and intermittent epinephrine, you would still need to transport that patient because we have the higher level of care with a pediatric surgeon who can fix their problem. The sending facility, they even though they don't have that surgeon, must stabilize the patient to the best of their abilities and try to ensure that the patient will not deteriorate during the transport. So if you decide to break the law, the cost is about $50,000 payable, to, chargeable to you and to your hospital. The patient can still sue you, and the hospital or physician may be barred from participation in Medicare and Medicaid programs, which is probably the most severe of the three punishments. Other notes that, that are applicable to us is that you can't transfer the patient to a lower level of care. For instance, if the patient is admitted to a PICU, Evansville has its own pediatric ICU, you couldn't transfer them to the 5 West unit at the Children's Hospital here because that would be a lower level of care. This can be a little bit tricky because if the patient is admitted to, say, Hard Memorial's floor with RSV, you would think, well, they can't step down to our ER, but a Children's Hospital ER is considered a higher level of care since it's a tertiary care center. So there are some intricacies that are involved in that. So that highlights three of the cases I wanted to bring up that demonstrate both a neonatal patient, a pediatric patient, and then an instance where you have to think a little bit more critically in how the patient's managed in regards to transport. Going forward in 2017, we do have some goals. First, portability. So there is a new monitor and defibrillators for our neonatal and infant patients. This gives, and our team could obviously speak to this better than myself, I've been on a few transports with them and there's a lot of bags and devices that they carry with them that are quite heavy. And so having this new monitor and defibrillator that fits right inside the isolette gives them one less piece of equipment to carry with them. It also allows for more easily placing the pads on the infant rather than having a separate device if you were to need to use a defibrillator. They will be starting with an electronic medical record that does speak to EPIC in the coming year. So safety, they have started using, we have, I say using, they have been trained on using video-assisted laryngoscopy. So in, out in the field, you don't have pediatric anesthesia when you go to Muhlenberg County Hospital. And most of those places may wait to intubate these children until our team gets there. And so some of these children may have difficult airways, and that might prove to be very difficult for that physician and the team. And so having these video-assisted laryngoscopy tools will be very useful for the team going forward. So there are guidelines like Karen discussed, um, both for the neonatal side and the pediatric side that are updated annually. And so availability, our team works very hard. She, Karen highlighted that they do over 2,000 trips a year and we have nine teams. 
St. Louis Children's or Wash U Hospital does maybe 300 more trips than us and has almost double the amount of team members. And so they're very excited to add a 10th team to our fleet this year, as well as a new ambulance. And then we want to continue doing more outreaches and simulations in these rural hospitals so that they become more accustomed to and used to doing neonatal and pediatric care. And we wanted to thank Dr. Gravari for her help, as well as Penny and our transport team members and all of our med control partners. Any questions? Uh, incredibly uh, important program, but I also want to be sure that uh, Dr. Schott, my longtime friend and colleague, uh, is appropriately recognized as the father of this transport uh, program. Uh, Roger uh, rejoined me uh, on the faculty in the late 1970s from Syracuse, New York, where he had experience with neonatal transport. And he sold this concept to me, and he sold it to the hospital uh, administration. And then he went to the Crusade for Children and, and obtained, uh, after design consultation, I think one of the largest grants at that time the Crusade had ever made of about $150,000 to build and inaugurate the first baby buggy. And uh, our philosophy was that this was a mobile neonatal intensive care unit. And it's hard to imagine, but uh, at that time, there was no neonatal intensive care outside of Louisville and Lexington. The only level of care were the pediatric <coughs> residents that we had trained and dispatched to Paducah and Owensboro and Henderson and, and Bowling Green. So it really was crucial to get care to these babies as quickly as possible, uh, and that was our philosophy. And I think uh, recognize also that there was, at the time we inaugurated this, no transport at St. Louis or Cincinnati or Lexington or Knoxville or Nashville. And I really think this was one of the major factors in building the preeminence of our neonatal program. The other was our philosophy. And our philosophy was we're never closed because we were the only uh, care available at that level. And I'm sure we oftentimes really stressed our nurses and our RTs and our fellows and our physical limits. But I think these two factors uh, were uh, very critically important. And I know our neonatal fellows at the time could tell you some wonderful war stories about uh, January trips to Paducah <laughs> in the snow that start to return uh, for 15 hours uh, in uh, duration. Uh, but of course, with air transport and so forth, we were able to move on. So incredible job of perpetuating this uh, program. And uh, Vicki brought the pediatric piece uh, on board, and you all have built on that. I, I think it's just an amazing program. Thank you. Uh, you know, listening to your talk, uh, I must say the problems of yesteryear are still present. You have local competition. <clears throat> There's no question about it. You have local fear of an unusual baby being born, and the first rule of thumb is they don't want to touch it. Uh, you have inadequate equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But in some way, somehow, the level of care locally has increased now, whether that's as a result of better training for the house staff and a greater familiarity with a particular period in life or with really sick, doubly sick, older children. I don't know, but I would presume so. So you, you're having right now a transition into a reasonable level of care for all babies and all children. We will not get there, however, until we have a uniformity of health care 
not just available, but everybody has as a part of being a citizen of this country. And we are the last. We, if you look at the in figures on the industrial top 17 industrialized countries in the United States, in the world, you want to live longer, go to Britain. You want to live longer, go to Germany. You want to live longer, go to Japan. They'll get at least two more years because everybody has health care. You want to see an immunized, totally immunized children population where nobody argues with the doctor, go to Cuba. 100% immunization. We've never had that here because somebody intellectualizes that, my God, my baby out of the 4 million born every year could be the one that doesn't do well with the immunization. So we've got a long, long, long way to go. Uh, and it still needs an incredible, intensive amount of work from the days of the amb local ambulance bringing the baby to Children's Hospital <coughs> was usually the funeral parlor limousine with the uh, casket brackets taken out. The gladiolas might not even be totally dried flowers yet. But thank you for a nice talk. A couple of um, practical questions. So as a hospitalist, a floor hospitalist, um, two things. There was at least one instance when we were trying to do an inter-hospital transport to Cincinnati. I was told I had to use fixed wing because there's no other way to transport across state lines. So that was sort of a weird thing, and I didn't understand if there were rules about that that we needed to know about. Um, and we've been encouraged, you know, whenever we talk to out, outlying physicians and facilities when they want to transport to the floor, we ask, do they need help with transport and offer these services? Are there certain patients for which we should always do that, other than we feel that they are sick or they seem like they don't have capability? Or are there other ways that we can promote using these services without wearing you guys out for stupid stuff? I'll answer the second one. Karen can probably answer the first okay. one. But I think with every transport call that you all receive, say, you know, they say we need you to accept the patient to the floor. They have GE, RSV, et cetera. You can say, okay, great. Let me go ahead and dispatch the team rather than, rather than, well, how do you want to get the patient here? Because if it's a pediatric patient, it is appropriate for our team to go. Um, the, uh, for clarity, the, the first of your questions about um, taking the fixed wing to Cincinnati, um, I don't know where that came from because our primary mode to go to Cincinnati would be ground because it's an hour and 15 minutes from here. And then secondarily, if the acuity warranted, we could we would use a rotor rather than the fixed wing. Um, but that is almost never, because hopefully we've stabilized the patient to the best of our capability before we would transport. Um, the uh, second one, uh, like Natalie was saying, we, we are very busy. Um, we do need more staff, and we're always hopeful that will be given more people that have uh, transport expertise. Um, that said, uh, we, uh, I ask, I don't know if the transfer team would agree with me, but I would say always offer our team. Um, if it's another facility that has a pediatric transport team, then they actually um, have more track record, so to speak, with that patient, and they may want to bring it with their own specialized team down to you. But if it's a regional center, then I would hope that our team would be able to have first dibs at, at getting that patient. Um, not in our um, our system. Uh, there's a list of medical control physicians, and so to use our specialty team, you have to go through, in your case, through the pediatric ICU physician as the medical control. And so um, distributing that out to your hospitalist colleagues would be um, helpful. Jeff um, knows that as well. Um, 
and you have to use us. It's not a burden for us to dispatch the team and to act as medical control. Uh, we have to um, help you do that. And so the system works, I think, fairly well the way it is. Uh, you can't, like Natalie said in her third case, put contingencies upon the transfer. So if that referral physician wants to use their local EMS service, then my recommendation to you, if you can't have a good communication and say, hey, there's something I'm worried about, I think our team would be better, then at least recommend that they use an ALS unit, which is a unit that would have a paramedic on it that has advanced airway skills, if that were the problem, or can do more medication or IV inter interventions. Um, but we try and have an open dialogue with the referral physician to say, these are our concerns based on what you've told me, and this is what we'd like for you to do. I think that's our time this morning. Thank you.